All right, everybody, let's wrap it up. Thank you for your discussion on the engagement track. I'd like to start off this time by going over here to Tom Timmon. Tom, right there you are. Okay, good morning once again. And I just want to comment quickly that uh, because this ELC is the last one in Williamsburg and the train moves on next year to Philadelphia, I can't help but think of the contrast to the very first ELC, which was 1991, and I'd been on the job for two weeks. And it was in Charlottesville, by the way, not Richmond, as was stated yesterday. It did move to Richmond for a while, then Hershey for a while, now here for a while. And I was wondering, you know, when I left my room yesterday morning to go running at 5.30, I was greeted by some sheep that were in a pen down the lane from my hotel room over at the Griffin. And so every morning as I walked over, I sort of went over and said hi to the sheep. Downtown Philadelphia near the convention center, I don't know what I'm going to encounter in the streets when I leave in the morning, but it should be fun. So we'll see you next year in Philadelphia. And I wanted to make one other comment on Robert Shea's wonderful uh, track, which I sat through mostly those sessions. And I want to call out a gentleman named Mark White from Deloitte, who gave the most clear, concise, interesting description of something called blockchain that I've heard. And I felt like when I came out of that session, I really understood what this is all about. But more importantly than just a piece of technology, it is really starting to transform a couple of agencies and their business processes. And so that was emblematic, I think, of that great track. But I'm not going to call on Mark to talk. I'm going to talk, call on someone who I did listen to at a table for a while. We heard her speak administratively from the podium, but now we're going to hear her speak substantively about what's going on in the agency and how mission delivery is really important, and that's Renee Wynn. Hi. So I guess it's RPW 2017. <laughs> no, good morning. Um, we've actually talked a little, a lot about everything, and why don't I go back to the blockchain conversation that we were having with data. So I think of uh, NASA as really being a scientific technology, engineering, and mathematics platform of data. Big data is small potatoes for us uh, in terms of what's coming back from space and what we're doing in aeronautics with so many partners across this globe. Uh, and that, and so what we were talking about is, is how do we share data more, and how do we break down some of those silos? Well, part of sharing data is trusting the data that you've got. Um, so, how many people have played sports? I'm going to borrow a golf analogy because I'm horrible at golf analogy. I just prefer the 19th hole. Um, <laughs> And that is, can you understand where, if you're standing at the 150 marker and you take out that trusty, we'll call it a pitching wedge, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, you take out your iron and you say, yeah, it's 150, and you know this iron is trusted at 150 yards, but it, the club actually hit, not you, but the club, hits it 120 yards with maybe a left hook. So now you're off target. So your data, your 150 and the data coming from your club were wrong because you're not where you want to be. So you've got to trust what you know about what you're doing. And so when data is moving across our pipes and we're sharing it with everyone, you have to know the pedigree of that data. Because if you're going to use it to pinpoint where a hurricane is coming, if you are going to use that data to drive your airplanes, anyone see the video of the flight between right the last off the island? You can thank the partnerships of the federal government to figure out the safest route between storms. That's data. What if that data were wrong? It would have been a very tragic day for a lot of individuals. And so the data where blockchain, I think, can help make a really big difference in the federal government is having these signatures within your data. So when I hook that up, you didn't see it take a left turn in, let's say, a nation state and then come back to you and wreck your infrastructure. That you said, yes, I wanted this piece of data and you've hooked up all the keys associated with blockchain from all the miners, 
in that and you've hooked those up and you know that that data can be used because it's got a pure pedigree for its intended purpose. And so now when you take out that club, that trusty 150 yard, it's going to work precisely as it need to and you're going to get up onto the dance floor or the green as they say and be able to do a one putt into the hole. But that's why data integrity really matters with where we're going and some of the newer technologies and these signatures and crypto keys that go with the data, that's where the difference is going to be made because you can trust the data that you get. And in this day and age, we need to build off of trust in order to make great things happen. So thank you. Okay, I think, yeah, well, thank you. I think Winston Churchill was talking about NASA, Renee when he said that you know, the mission of NASA, to use your analogy, is to send a very small capsule to a very small planet very far away. So you have to have good data to do that. All right, I'm going to throw it over to the redoubtable Francis Rose. I'm here at table 15, and uh, Lionel, I promised you that I was going to pick on you. You didn't think I could read it upside down. Now don't, I, I promised Stacy that I was not going to blame her or call on her for anything. Uh, you guys had a terrific conversation here about uh, engagement. Tell me what you uh, read out of this. Right. I will. Do you want me to read the question and then what the answer is to that question? Just, or just give okay. us a 60 second brief. So we talked more about uh, earned value management uh, metrics. Ed here told us how much he likes metrics and how much it actually means in order to a point of measure. Um, as you uh, work in industry and government between the two. Um, 30 seconds more. Falling off your dinosaur. <laughs> Falling off your dinosaur with the way that we talk about KPIs. It's dead, it's over. Let's talk about trends. Let's get more contextual about things. So we talk more about uh, what, what industry and what government does today in order to, to uh, measure those points instead of just doing SLAs. You know, you see a lot of reports out there um, measuring, you know, phone calls, you hang ups to the help desk, you know, that kind of stuff. How long does somebody actually s sit waiting? Um, social media, you know, those kind of points. It, it sounds like the conversation resolved, uh, revolved primarily around something that I see in government a lot now, which is how do we measure outcomes versus outputs? If somebody's on the phone, if you answer a thousand phone calls, that's not really necessarily the best measure, right? Yes, and the other thing we discussed was defining government. You know, government is not just, you know, uh, full-time employees, um, you know, as a, the federal sense, but it's industry as well, because the kind of stuff you see, it's not, I mean, it's contractors working in government, but then you also have industry, they're working on their own. I mean, they're working with government in order to uh, meet their needs and, and um, have success. Thank you very much. And uh, Jason Miller has the microphone in a box right over here. Yeah, I do. And I learned something. Maybe you all remember this from last year. But uh, uh, I was being told from this table here that um, from Shark Tank, this is a, a Shark Tank one. Did I get that right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Anyways. All right. So uh, no one's as impressed as I was. OK. So I sat with uh, 24, but I'm going to have nine tell us a little bit. But uh, one of the interesting conversations we had was they turned the, the the conversation on me and said, Jason, how do you measure customer success? How do you measure metrics? And we got into a whole conversation about cake and cookies and vegetables. So um, that's a different discussion. So you'll have to ask Richard and Tiffany in this table here about that. But uh, so Kevin Cook's going to tell us a little bit about what their table discussed. You can get the whole, oh, here we go, ready? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> It's like a basketball. I'm from Kentucky, so it was easy. <laughs> uh, so we talked uh, a lot about uh, defining uh, who the customer is in order to make sure we're doing a good job in terms of mission engagement. A lot of things we talked about were just sort of keeping it simple and back to basics. So we had some examples from, from HUD, of course, uh, USDA, and, and the post office. And so uh, just a few things we talked about. One is uh, the, when you're thinking about the customer experience and engagement, uh, quality versus quantity, making sure you're doing a good job, just not doing a lot of things uh, sort of in a mediocre way. Uh, actually listening uh, to the customer needs and sort of not how we want to do things, but what the needs are. Uh, incentivizing the team to deliver um, on engagement. Uh, think about how what you're doing fits into the big picture. So uh, one of the examples we use is from an IT perspective. 
So a lot of times we're thinking about from the developer to the test group and that kind of thing. But what is this thing that you're actually uh, developing? What's the service that it's going to be used for uh, on the ground? So, so making sure you think about that. Uh, we talked about uh, start with the why. Why are we doing this particular uh, service or activity? Um, and the last thing we talked about, which was pretty good, have the team switch roles a lot in order to make sure that they understand sort of the complete cycle of activity and, and again, staying engaged and uh, communicating at all levels. So it's, did I leave anything out, guys? No. You got it. They better shake their heads. There. <laughs> it's a tough. All right. Basically. Thanks, everybody. And just as a reminder, we're capturing all of the outcomes, and we're going to be summarizing them into a report that we're going to use for ongoing programming and also share with OMB and other administration leaders. So your, your table contributions are being captured. So with that, we're going to move to the third track, the protection track. And I'd like to ask Trevor to come up and give us a readout from yesterday's events. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? All right, very good, very good. Uh, so we'll start on a, a dark, or a finish on a dark and stormy note, of course, security. Uh, it actually isn't all dark and stormy. Uh, a lot of positive things came out of yesterday. Uh, I'd like to first start, though, by acknowledging my co-chair, uh, Ross Noderft. Uh, he's actually my successor. He's now the head of the OMB uh, cyber team. Uh, he was recalled uh, back to DC. Uh, I was going to insert a Russian joke there, but I uh, figured it's probably uh, too soon, too soon. <laughs> Too soon. Uh, so let's, uh, let's recap what we talked about yesterday. Uh, we started off with a great panel on uh, next generation uh, security operations uh, and networking, and specifically how the government can move beyond perimeter-based protections to start thinking about protecting the identity, protecting the applications, and protecting the data uh, within their environments. And some of the things we talked about uh, as far as what you have to consider is you know with this evolution to the to the cloud, you can't just do a lift and shift, right? It's just it's not it's not practical. Uh, the government needs to think about how they can maintain situational awareness in these environments, uh, having the right tool sets uh, for those environments, and having the right uh, human resources capabilities, having the right talent to actually execute in the cloud. And then one of the interesting pieces that Sarah Mosley from DHS brought up is you actually have to understand what's in your contracts. Right? When, you, when you outsource a lot of this work, when you go to the cloud, 20% uh, of the risk actually falls on the provider, the rest is to the government. Right? So having that risk conversation is very, very important. So that was the first uh, panel. Then we moved on to CDM in our innovation zone. That's the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program at DHS. And the program, uh, really the, the theory behind it is uh, that we, through tools and sensors, will actually up the baseline of security across the federal government. This one was particularly interesting on a personal level uh, because when I started at OMB back in 2012, CDM was a, it was a concept, it was a theory, right? And then in 2014, we actually wrote a policy on it. Pretty neat. Now it's actually a reality. CDM is being used and was used most recently to actually answer the call for the Kaspersky Binding Operational Directive. Pretty neat stuff. In real time, agencies are actually able to go out, figure out what Kaspersky instances they had, and remove them. Pretty neat, we couldn't do that five years ago. Anybody remember Heartbleed? That was all manual, perhaps not the most efficient way of doing things. Uh, and then we closed with our ELC talks uh, where we really talked about the appropriate role for government in solving our cybersecurity issues. So we had Chris Walashin from HHS talk about the HKIC, right, and, and how HHS is playing a coordinating role uh, amongst health providers uh, to coordinate threat information, right, to get ahead of the threat. Uh, then we had uh, Jason Ogden talk about voter system security and the role DHS is playing working with states and lo localities to actually protect us from, you guys know who. Uh, and then uh, we closed uh, on an idea of perhaps creating a technology version of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. So Jason, you heard it here first. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy the discussion.